Hello and welcome to the first episode of the all new Digital Digest podcast. In this first episode, I'm chatting with my friend Geet Kosla, an Indian entrepreneur based in Europe who runs his own agency focused on helping brands connect with influencers. In this episode, we'll be chatting about what it's like to grow up in India at the time when the country was just opening up, being in business with your family, starting your business instead of having a degree, getting your company's money stolen and having coffee with Gandhi. Stick around until the end of the interview for my final thoughts and some additional content. Hi. What's up? <laughs> um, can, you, um, can you present yourself for people who may not know who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, yeah my name is uh, Geet Kostler. I am uh, an entrepreneur. I run uh, a few companies and I've always done that since as long as I can remember. So yeah, that's pretty much who I am. Cool. And you are originally from India, is that right? Yeah, originally and still Indian, from India. So yeah. just, I just tend to live in Europe most of the year. But yeah, I'm from India. I was uh, born in uh, Delhi. My dad is uh, from Kashmir, from the really northern part. My mom is from Punjab. Uh, and I was brought up and I was sort of, I'm kind of one of the few people who can call himself a true Indian because I've lived in the north, in the west, in the east and the south. Okay. So I've lived all over the country. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Cool. So you grew up um, throughout India? Pretty much, yeah. And then I predominantly spent most of my uh, adolescence, so teenage years and you know, middle school, high school mm -hmm. in South India, in an in international school in South India. So I never left India until I was 18, but I still have this sort of uh, Anglo-American, European mix accent because all my, all yeah. my classmates were from, from all over the world and, and I didn't speak English until I was like 14. So I learned English at a pretty late age. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, we spoke Hindi or Tamil or whatever other languages before that. So, yeah, spoke. Mm -hmm. I learned English uh, a little bit. There. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and so, when <coughs> did you um, come to Europe? Was it to study? Was it for something else? That's actually like pretty interesting because um, <laughs> after I graduated high school, my dad, uh, <coughs> my parents also run a, a business. They've been entrepreneurs as well. So, mm -hmm. I guess I kind of. It runs in the family. Business. Yeah, exactly. We all sort of uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad wanted me to sort of get into accounting after I finished high school. That didn't really go to plan. But uh, <clears throat> so I finished high school and I sort of realized that I really hated accounting. I worked in Ernst & Young for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's not really my cup of tea. I don't really like it. It's not really what I'm into. Yeah. And so I sort of did the total opposite thing that was move to Paris at 18 and learn French. So I just went to Alliance Francaise to, to learn French, just mm -hmm. move to Paris, um, which was uh, really, really crazy. Now looking back on it, like not even like just an 18 year old getting from India, just, you know, booking some courses <laughs> in Alliance Francaise and finding a place online to live. But it was like the best uh, experience ever. And I ended up staying in Paris for a little bit longer, worked at LVMH for a little bit. After that, I got a job through one of my classmates at LVMH uh, to pay rent because, as you know, Paris is very expensive to live in. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so that's how that was my first move to Europe, moving to Paris when I was eighteen, and then, yeah, then been been sort of studied French in Paris, uh, and then studied German in in Dusseldorf for a little bit, and then I realized I should actually like do a like study something real, like academics. So I went to the Rotterdam School of Management oh. and uh, did the bachelor degree. In business. Yeah. And that's how you found yourself in, in Rotterdam. Yeah, in Rotterdam, pretty much. Yeah, so that's. Uh, but another side angle, another story as well is that my parents have an office in Rotterdam for our company, so it was kind of also made sense to sort of just be there. Oh, nice. Very easy. Like, I mean, I mean, I, I mean <clears throat> I've always sort of like studied and worked. I've never like uh, you know I started my first real business on my own when I was nineteen mm -hmm. uh, at Erasmus University uh, at the university when I was studying. Yeah. And that actually ended up leading to me dropping out of the university because uh, I didn't. Have enough credits, and they were not very, and they were not, uh, you know, the most. Uh, they've they've improved a lot right now. They've become much more entrepreneurial. But when I was studying back in two thousand eight nine, mm -hmm. they were not very. Uh, how do I call it? Entrepreneurial focused. Like they thought that entrepreneurs are wasting their time, or you know, fucking around, or wasting, you know, not really studying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but in the end, it all worked out. I, you know, got got a master from somewhere else and did fine. So, yeah. so did you? Um did you move to running your company full-time at that moment? Um, or well, 
so the so the way I mean because I have two Indian parents right so like there's there's academics have to be around somewhere yeah so yeah. so I was pretty much was running my company full time as well as studying the entire time mm -hmm. from when I started it to when I sold it like the four four year four and a half year period mm -hmm. it was it was studying my bachelor's and my master's in the period of in that period so the when I sold my business was a, a week or two after I finished my thesis so it okay. was pretty much like the worst idea possible in the world to run a company and to study a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, but yeah, that's how I did it. So, <laughs> okay, um, I, I want to move back a bit. Um, what was the the first job that you've ever had? I know you mentioned the family yeah. business. Yeah. Was so yeah, I know that was the first thing I ever did. So I think when I was around maybe like twelve or thirteen, mm -hmm. um, I. Because my family at the time we were producing garments, we were we were making uh, we were making like clothes for H and M, C and A, Saks Avenue, a few other big brands, and so like I, my job was kind of to like looking back on it, it was quite responsible stuff, but I just kind of had to do it then. So like was yeah. was handling payroll and was uh, making sure that I, like all the because we had a bunch of we had like close to a hundred employees at the time so to make sure everyone's getting their stuff done yeah. not like high level stuff but sort of certain things so my dad would give me or my parents would give me specific things to handle and I would just take care of it okay and that was kind of my first quote unquote job but yeah I didn't really feel like a job never really understood never really yeah felt like that but yeah that's what it was I would say how um how old were you at the time about twelve thirteen twelve okay. Um, and and did you learn anything? Well, I mean, I, I bet you learned a yeah. ton of things. But anything um, meaningful or anything? But I think worth the, sharing. I think the biggest thing I learned, and I think I'm still learning it right now, is like how people work. Mm -hmm. Like that's always been my sort of biggest thing that I really like to understand how people function and you know what, what, <clears throat> what drives them, what pisses them off, what what pushes them, you know, what inspires them. So, like when I was like uh, 12 or 13, I remember like. 50 rupees more on someone's paycheck would make them happy or mm -hmm. you know getting an extra scooter or or like back then in India you it was very expensive to buy like you know like uh, sort of because you, you India was just opening up because India was yeah. India was a closed economy till like 91 mm -hmm. and then it was just opening up so a, a lot of new things in the country were kind of like it was kind of like the Soviet Union opening up right like everything new was cool like you had to yeah. have it. so so like people getting these things would motivate them, would motivate some people, but it wouldn't motivate other people. Other people would motivate if my dad like was, because he was the big boss, if he would like smile at them or, or like if I was joking with them, like that would make them better. So I learned quite a bit of Investing how, in your employees kind of thing? Exactly, investing in your employees, but also just like how important people are to an organization because mm -hmm. like we had, we had some pretty tough times as well. Like, uh, you know, uh, we went through some transitions because my parents have a totally different business now and I, I help out with that too. But mm -hmm. we, we went through a pretty big transition and, and we realized how people are, people make up your company. Nothing else matters. Like yeah. really at the end of the day, you can, besides having an okay product, if you don't have a good team, you know, you, you're really, really screwed. So I learned that very young, how important it is to surround yourself with really good people. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Right, and then what was your first um, your first job or your first role in the digital and, and tech industry that we're in right now? Yeah, so I mean, there's two ways of looking at that question, right? So one way is when I was 19, I I started the company, so my 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 own let's say startup, mm -hmm. we would call it now. Everyone uses the word startup now as like a gimmicky thing, but. You know, back in 2000, was it nine or something? Like eight or nine before that even. Like it was 2009, I think, 2008. It was um, it was not really that common, right? So like you wouldn't really Especially go, in Europe. Especially in Europe. Like it wasn't like, oh my God, I have a startup. Uh, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was kind of like, I remember there's one other guy in the university that I was with. It was just me and him. We were the two entrepreneur idiots who were running our own company. Yeah. And he's doing really well, as well now, so I'm proud of him. So, But um, the thing is like, it it kind of wasn't a tech thing, but it ended up becoming a tech thing. Mm -hmm. So so the concept was pretty simple. It was just like I needed to find an internship for myself, and I and I couldn't really find any good ones in Europe that were, let's say, 
you know, worthy of spending yeah. time. They were, they were me just, it was mostly just, you know, photocopy this, do that. Yeah, and it, yeah. for, usually you wouldn't get money. You wouldn't, you would earn anything and you wouldn't really get new experiences. Then there were ones like in Asia or in, or in, or in the U S that you had to pay like five or six or 10,000 euros to go and yeah. to go and work there. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? Like, this is crazy. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm sure there's some way of doing it. So my dad and I have a lot of contacts in India, so I said, hey, I'm sure if I can package it in a smart way where, you know, students would love to get an experience where they would go and work in another country for four to six months, totally different uh, atmosphere, actually be given really, really big responsibilities like marketing, yeah. finance, in a, big, in a sort of medium to large company. <clears throat> I'm sure, would, and also, like, if I could handle their housing and food and everything, yeah. you know, it would be a nice, it would be a really easy thing for them. So I kind of started doing that, and then to make things work faster i had to make it tech if you know what i mean yeah like, yeah make things work better like it was yeah. so so instead of instead of promoting it like by flyers as we did the first time it was like okay coming up with the you know banner ads on the university uh, to the website and there was a thing called uh there was a thing called blackboard i don't know if they still have yeah it. yeah I, I had that at university yeah. yeah yeah so there was a blackboard thing and you could get like private messages so mm -hmm. i had i spoke to the blackboard team and you know we got the messages done for the university because it was specifically for rotterdam university students mm -hmm. that's how it started yeah and then <clears throat> and then like i remember like the first like from the conception of the idea to three months later i sent like i think 22 people to india uh for an internship wow, and i that's awesome. and i it was amazing, and I, I remember like, <laughs> and I remember like, taking taking almost no money from them. I think I took like three hundred fifty euros, something like that. There was there was nothing, mm -hmm. but I remember like I had like I don't know what is it like almost eight thousand euros in my account, bank account, and I was like, what the fuck is happening? This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of like this, you know, aha moment that I can actually do this, and that sort of to, to sort of then I got like a couple of <clears throat> a couple of designers and developers on board to make the site a bit better. To make the onboarding a bit better, to make the application procedure a bit more automated. So, and also the other side of it, which was the companies. Like, cause, now this was a few companies in India that we got, but then we got companies from all over Asia. We had about companies from I think about eighty-six countries at the end of it when we sold, oh, wow. and we were sending nearly like eight thousand students every month to internship. Uh, to, like, it became internships as well as short-term employment contracts, okay. and that's a different part of the business. But yeah, it's. Uh, there's a lot in that. But yeah, that was my first sort of exposure with the tech world. Uh, so and it was worked. through your first company yeah, and internet. Exactly. And, and, and also, but, but, like, but then it was, like, it was sort of like, it was just a website in Joomla and it was very, very, you know, basic stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was like, and I sort of like, I still, I didn't do the coding. I got somebody on board to do the coding because mm -hmm. I just, like, I was spending time running the company. And it was still very, very I would say non-tech still, but it was like, I, go, I was like, oh, wow, this isn't crazy. Like, yeah. something can happen here. But my real, I would say, like, my second experience with tech was at the next web. Like, when I really sort of, when I was working with them, I was like, okay, this is something, like, this is really, like, you can transform industries with this. You can, yeah. you know, quote, unquote, change the world with this shit stuff, you know? And I think that was, that was yeah. like, the second wave of learning about tech. Yeah. Okay. But so the first, uh, the first business was basically you were running it, you, maybe a friend, and then just leveraging tech to avoid well, having was, to... Well, it was, it was me. And then, and then because like, like I said, I made eight grand pretty mm -hmm. fast, right? Yeah. In like, like, like a few months. And it was only me doing all the work. And there was no, like, I, 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 had, I had a few ways of making money. I made money from the students and I also made money from the companies. Yeah. So, uh, like, I, I was, it, was a, it was a pretty good revenue model. So really it was, good hustle. <laughs> yeah, it was good. That's the only way to do it, right? So that's all I know how to do. That's all I know how to do. <laughs> I was like, so, no, but that was pretty good. And I started, I, so I could hire a team pretty fast. So yeah. it, there were, there was, I was the only founder. And uh, <clears throat> there was one other co-founder, which, which comes back to the reason I sold the company. But we can talk about that in a second if you like. But yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was, yeah, so we just, there was, I was the only, I was the only founder and then I had a small core team and then we, we grew pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, so it was just, and we focused on universities. So that was very, very, because Europe and the U.S. have amazing universities and amazing university sort of, um, what do you call it? Recruitment <laughs> centers. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so you, if I just send them an email saying what I'm doing, they were like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, come on, you know, free office space. <laughs> free interns, free whatever, do whatever you want to do, we, we can help you set up. Mm -hmm. So we had offices in like, our biggest office was in Esade, in, <coughs> Esade in Barcelona. 
And for like, uh, they gave us like five rooms wow. for free, because and we and because they were like, we really liked the concept. <clears throat> so we, and not, but also like London universities were really helpful. Mm-hmm. The universities in the U.S. were very helpful too. But you know, it was like it was kind of a really really good time. But it was yeah. That's fine. Oh, that, that's really cool. It's funny because hearing you talking about this, and we we haven't really talked about this company before, even um, mm-hmm. privately. But um, no, we haven't. No. We, I mean, on the one hand, it reminds me of what the the university that I went to in England tried to do, and they had a, a what they called a placement office where they tried to put students and companies in touch with one another. But the problem was there were very limited spaces. Um, and honestly, they, at the time when I was there, at least they weren't doing too good a job. So, for and, example, yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, that's why that's why they really liked us because when we showed up and said, "Hey, we'll handle everything for you and give you like, I don't know, a hundred more placements," and they were like, "What?" So, <laughs> so they were like, "Please come in." So, yeah, that was helpful. Yeah. The uh, the one in Brighton basically worked as a, a like a just an announcement board, like a Craigslist or something, where companies would just advertise, students would apply, but. Besides giving you a few advice, they wouldn't do much else. Um, and to give you an idea, for a class of 35 to 40 students, only five of us uh, actually applied and got internships at the time. Yeah. So that was yeah. super low. Oh yeah, and I, I mean, like Brighton is a really good school. Like it's one of the sort of you know one of the one of the better known sort of in terms of like art and design and sort of mm. stuff like that. And I think. I remember, I remember when we were doing this, we, we focused only on the big schools because we had to consolidate our, yeah, you know, course, like, yeah. we were like, okay, London, okay, we're going to focus on a few, like King's, LSE, a few other big schools, mm-hmm. and Cambridge, Oxford, of course, and these big schools. So what ended up happening there was we, we really had a, I mean, it was, it was crazy because, like you said, there was a really bad service before we came in. Yeah. And then we showed up and we said, hey, you know, we, we, we sent people to give presentations and we sort of really, we said, hey, we're going to give you, like, we, we also kind of understood the experience the students wants to have. Mm-hmm. So we also, we also gave them, like, like I said, free accommodation in the country, free as they paid us for the service. So it was accommodation. Yeah. As well as, like, the food was taken care of in the country, so they didn't have to worry about the food either. For like we, a certain amount of time? or Like, so the way it worked was, <clears throat> the, the, at the end of it, the intern, like, for the, the person would pay us, like, a thousand euros, right? Mm-hmm. I think it was a thousand to about two thousand, depending on what they wanted. And then it was like the accommodation was taken care of, and then like there were a certain amount of groceries that were put in the house. So, oh, wow. so it was like uh, so the way because instead of them going like in, I don't know, in India or in or in China and you know buying some dog meat and whatever, yeah, yeah. doing something wrong, like we were like, hey, explore the culture, explore everything, but as a basic minimum, we can give you like a full fridge every week, you know. Wow. So. So and and on the other end of it, we signed up with local companies that were doing all that for us. So so we we signed up in India. We signed up. We had a partnership with India's biggest real estate company, mm-hmm. where we had like uh, four or five um, apartment buildings that we rented from them. So mm-hmm. it was much cheaper for us to rent it, and because and then those apartment buildings were full of international students, and it was like also it was kind of almost felt like an exchange, but kind of everyone was working for like. Reliance, Microsoft, small companies, yeah, big companies, yeah. whatever. It was kind of like a really good mix of, you know, NGOs as well. So it was kind of like a really nice uh, atmosphere. And you had students from, from, from like from Copenhagen, from from you know from England, from from Holland, from Germany, France, Italy. Everyone like living together who would never usually mean living together in like Vietnam or India or China. Yeah. And and so that was kind of so we definitely did a lot of work for it. But looking back on it, it was I really wish I had known stuff I know now about tech because I would have automated so much more and I would have, yeah. you know, like, cause I just spent, like, I just burnt out pretty much myself just working, like hustling like crazy cause you had to, cause there was no other way of doing it, you know? And I mean, <clears throat> yeah, so that was, yeah. But anyway, that was it. That, that's really cool. And just trying to put myself in the shoes of, uh, of a student doing this. I mean, oh, that was pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it must be great to just having everything be sorted out for you. Um, oh, yeah. The other thing I, wa- uh, I wanted to mention was uh, it's interesting that you've mentioned this offering that, that you guys were doing because uh, I know the French government has something like that now and I don't know how long they've had it for where you can, if you're still studying and or under 26, uh-huh. they can send you to French companies abroad and you work That's with them cool. and the accommodation is taken care of and... So that, it, it's similar to what you're doing, and it, it, that's it, cool. And I think they might have copied me, so it's fine. I don't, <laughs> I, yeah. 
I love the French government, so they can take it. Like, I don't mind. <laughs> That's a no, repayment it, for giving you a good experience in Paris. Oh, yeah, I guess. yeah, for sure, absolutely. <laughs> and take it. I had a really good time in Paris, so you can keep all you want. Yeah. No, but I think it's a, I think it, I think I think that, like especially things like also in the startup world like startup Chile and, and you know those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think it's so smart if governments start doing that because you need to kind of you know I think especially with the with the with the problem of you know unemployment in Europe and the youth and stuff like that. I mean it's not as bad as in you know Asia or in other countries, but it's still like it's the still graph bad. is going the other way, not the positive way. So mm -hmm. I think they can definitely like do these kind of things to get them excited and also make them stand out of the workforce. And French companies are literally everywhere, you know. So it would be it would be awesome to work it, them. Yeah. It's been a recent push. I mean, France has this history of corporate companies, and um, and so for the longest time, we didn't put a lot of emphasis on startups. And then for the past few years, we've had okay. Secretary of States in digital affairs and stuff like that. Oh, and wow. They're they're trying to push things. It's <laughs> and I mean, I mean, like I think someone we both know, Roxanne, like she's doing some amazing stuff uh, yeah. with. With the whole, with I forget the name of the guy, but the biggest startup incubator in the world or something is coming in Leal, right? Like I heard about that. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's in Leal Fresine, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's so where like the where, like where the where the RER used to come in, like right above there, right? That entire Leal yeah. area, right next to Santo Novo, right, right behind there. That's the area, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was like, that's like in the center of Paris, like the biggest incubation center in the world, the biggest startup incubator in the world is going to come up. That's insane. It's crazy. Yeah, so they, it's really hard to find the space, but as far as I'm aware, and obviously I'd love to get Roxanne on the podcast to talk about it, um, but I think this space was abandoned for the longest time, and so this, um, this famous entrepreneur who's behind one of the, the top uh, uh, four or five uh, telcos in France. Um, What's his name again? Xavier Niels. That's it, yeah, because I, I heard, like, I, I was at Le Web once when him and Louis were talking, but I just couldn't remember his name right now. That's him, yeah. He's, uh, so he's made his fortune doing this and, and a bunch of other things, but then he started uh, being an angel and focusing on helping tech businesses in France. And so he, him and a few other collaborators bought this huge place that, yeah, they're, um, I think they're currently building it and it's going to be finished soon. Mm -hmm. Um, That's amazing. I can't. Yeah. I, I'm definitely gonna try and get some space in there for one of Yeah, months. yeah, you should. Like whether it's a temporary thing or if you want to get a local office in Paris. <laughs> oh no, for sure, I do. definitely in Paris. Is definitely <laughs> on my list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're recording this uh, at the beginning of January. Uh, I'm thinking of posting this podcast in February to give myself enough time to uh, to do a bunch of other things related to that. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you. As we wrapped up 2015 and started 2016, <clears throat> did you have any um, any cool tech events or products or stories or startups that you've seen this past year? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's like definitely a couple of things. So um, I was lucky enough to go to the Web Summit as well as um, the next Web Conference. This year I couldn't do too many more, but <clears throat> because so, I was busy, I was busy setting up a startup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can't go to too many conferences, but um, no. But it was like I think, um, like the way I see it, like there's there's so much happening right now, like in the general tech world. Like there's there's just so much of amazing stuff going on. Like I mean, <clears throat> just like consumer tech, business tech, fintech, every kind of tech. There's like all these amazing companies <laughs> that are coming in, and there's so much going on. And I think, like you know, places like the Next Web Conference, the Web. Web, the web summit these kind of places are, are are like a really really good place to sort of experience it yeah um like but like whenever i go to an event like this to me it's always like oh they could do this better or that better or this better or that better or these many things better you know or because like because we we, we missed out a bit of a chunk in the middle of what i did after like selling my company yeah i i i, I sort of i worked with the next web and i worked for a couple of big creative agencies in london Mm -hmm. And I had my own creative agency as well. And then recently, like in 2015, the beginning of the year in April, I started my started my newest startup now. Mm -hmm. So it's been a pretty busy period for me as well. Yeah. And 2015 was just like a period of setting up a foundation for my own agency. Uh, so uh, I'll, I can talk about that a little bit, right? That's yeah, cool. yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I realized that I forgot to mention the, uh, the exit of your company and yeah. the, the next web part, which I'd love to get into. 
Yeah. So we can get into that right now, maybe before we get into this, because that would set up the background a little bit. So, um, <laughs> like, this is a fun story to finish, like, my first chapter. And I think, like, my life sometimes goes in four-year chapters. Like, yeah, that's kind yeah. of how it goes sometimes. That sounds so, about right, yeah. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. So, so, when I, so I started this company in 23 when I was, um, like, finishing my, my, my academic, let's say, for, for the moment academic career. I was finishing my thesis. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, at the time, I had uh, kind of a CFO. Um, and he, he was supposed to manage, I mean, he's a CFO, right? So he's supposed to take care of all the finances. Yeah. So I, I took a month off because I had to work. I focused on my thesis. And I said, okay, I'm going to take, a, like, not a month two weeks off mm-hmm. and I had some friends in Oxford I, and I went to like live with them and work with them sort of you know no no social media no nothing no phones just two three weeks of focused work mm-hmm. on my thesis because it was really really I was really lagging on it and and I would just go to a near town and you know like put my phone on and after the first week there I went to the town nearby and I put my put my phone on and um I remember that um like I had, I think maybe a hundred missed calls, wow, and, and like close to like six hundred fifty messages and WhatsApp, everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what the hell is going on? And I got a, and, I, and like, uh, and out of the out of the missed calls, like I have like more than half of them are from my bank manager in in AB and Emerald, which is the bank that was doing all my work. Mm-hmm. I remember, and I remember calling speak calling him back, and he, and he said uh, he said, Geet, all the money is gone." I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, because he's like all the finances that we had, all the money that we had saved. Because we are a cash flow, we're a cash flow dependent company, so we get paid, you know, and then we pay everybody. Yeah. Hence, yeah. I wish I had more tech at the time. I wouldn't have had to pay so many people. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> but um, I remember, so my my CFO had just taken all the money out and just disappeared. Wow. Uh, because he was the only person who had access to all the funds. Okay. And and uh, I I, call, I knew his parents. I called them up and I called his family, and they hadn't heard from him. So I flew back down to Amsterdam. Our office was in Amsterdam at the time. Okay. Actually, it was in Rotterdam. So I flew back down to Rotterdam and and uh, like asked the team, and they said we don't know. He's just gone somewhere. So it was really really strange. And and like long story short, I hired some really good lawyers and and like a couple of investigators, and we found him. Mm-hmm. Like he had an addiction problem. So. Oh, okay. Like, so he sort of, he just stole the money and just, like, left. And luckily, his parents paid me back. They were quite well off. So I was just like, this is, I can't do this anymore. Like, it, yeah. was, just, it was just kind of the edge of my, like, level because I'd been, I'd been really burning out, like, working my ass off yeah. and running a business and, and sort of running my sort of career, so uh, my, my, my academics. So it was kind of a really tough, tough period. And I said, what the hell am I doing? So I just said, okay, I'm just going to, you know, like, I just pretty much, like, in one week, fired everybody like I had to let everybody go because I just because I just because I can't handle this anymore you know and I just uh, you know I mean I'm not and in the sense as in fired everybody and like I finished their contracts and like that I had and let everybody go which was really really a tough period and then a really tough time and I had to finish my thesis I finished that barely but I got it okay it was done mm-hmm. and and I remember like asking a friend of mine I said hey do you know someone I can sell my business to because I'm kind of done I'm just kind of finished with it yeah so uh, the the weekend after I finished my thesis, I uh, one of my friends invited me to an investor party in London, and one of the investors there was like, "Hey, do you want to come work for me?" I said, "No, do you want to buy my company?" He said, "Yeah, sure." Like, <laughs> so so after after like a week of that conversation, uh, two weeks actually, we we finished all the details, and I and he bought my company, and it was and um, it was not for it was for much less than I would have liked to have sold it, but it was just a time in my life now, just kind of done with it. You were what, twenty four? Twenty three at the time. Twenty three. Yeah, so I was kind of very. I was just exhausted, and I was kind of like, I just need a break from all of this. I just want to go back, you know, go to India for a bit. Go, you know, one of my friends is from the Philippines, and like a couple other, like just chill out, just take some time off, and you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really chilled in the last four years, one at the time. So I was like, okay, let me just take some time off. <laughs> I think you deserved yeah. it. I did. Yeah, it was it was a pretty crazy time, and I, but the, anyway, that finished, and and then after that, I sort of. Uh, this friend who introduced me to the investor, um, he at the time used to run uh, an agency in London, mm-hmm. uh, an app development agency and a creative agency. And uh, he said, "Hey, dude, do you want to, you know, come work for me for a bit if you want?" And because I, I wanted to stay in London for a little bit longer anyway, and, and I was like, "Sure, why not?" So I did some business development for him, mm-hmm. and I and I and, the, and our team worked on some pretty big projects with Burberry and with some other big companies. So I learned a lot about the creative industry and also learned about 
the tech and creative industry together quite a bit and yeah. finished that up and then I was at a, a next the, one of the next web conferences mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that was the one when we met perhaps I think that might have been 2013 the one. Uh, uh, wait, no, 20, well, yeah, no, 20, 2013 is when we met. Okay, 20, then I was, okay, so, so that, that, that was when, uh, Patrick offered me the job at, uh, it was either that one or the one, I think, yeah, that was the one, yeah. 2013? No, I think it was 2012. Doesn't matter. So, uh, and I, I think, uh, I remember I was like at the Next Web conference and I, and I spoke to Patrick and, uh, Patrick and Boris, the guys who run the, the Next Web. The Next Web. I've known them for a, for, for a while and, and I just said, hey, and, you know, Patrick was like, hey, do you want to do something with us? Uh, we have a company in house that needs someone who's kind of a business tech guy. I said, sure. So it was kind of funny, but I was offered like a CEO position at this, uh, at this startup and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> that was pretty fun. <laughs> Let's do this. So it was, it was a lot of fun and I worked with them for about, uh, about almost eight months, I think. It, it just, Everything was good, but I, the only thing was that I'm 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 a very bad employee. I just learned that like in the time, and it's kind of like I'm just kind of someone who likes to you know do things my way and mm -hmm. kind of just push the envelope. And I and like they are amazing guys. The next club has the best team, and and you know I'm still friends with all of them. They're still invited to all the conferences. So that's nice, and so I mean it's it's all good. But yeah, no. So, so that leads up to where we left off last time. Yeah. Was you know, and I sort of also did some other work, ran a creative agency in Amsterdam for a bit, um, and then it leads up to 2015, where we, um, I, I, I finished my creative agency in Amsterdam, uh, and at the end of 2014, and I just took some time off, and I went to India, uh, ten year period again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, four year period again. Yeah, so, yeah, four, you know, yeah. Uh, And then I sort of said, okay, I'm just going to take some time off, go back home, check it. Uh, you know, relax a little bit, um, and then uh, my sister, uh, both my sisters, my Deepa and Andita, they're my, they run a blog, mm -hmm. um, and and Deepa's like the blog was I think is going to be two years old in February, and and she is uh, like they together run it, and, and she's the biggest fashion influencer from India, so uh, yeah, really so it's crazy, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> she has, she has more than half a million followers right now. And my younger sister takes all the photos. They're both younger than me, but the youngest one takes the photos, and you know they're they're a team together. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like I already was kind of in the influencer industry a little bit because I was helping her with some creative stuff and some you know business stuff and some deals. And then me and her were in India. We we're talking about what I'm going to do next, and I said this. Let's let's just try this out, you know, for a little bit. And then I got into the industry and and. Yeah, man, the last year has been pretty, pretty hectic. So we, we set up, we kind of set up an agency and I kind of fell into this, uh, fell back into the agency world in a way. And, um, but yeah, for we, yourself. For myself this time, exactly. And I mean, like I ran a creative agency before as well, but it was with a partner and that didn't really work out. So I realized that, okay, I, mean, I have to do things my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, and I just have to have some great people around me and then I think it'll be, it'll be good because I just like to push things, you know, a bit more, in a, in a bit more forward thinking way. So the agency right now is called GDNK, everyone at gdnk.co is the link mm -hmm. um, online. But uh, we, we, we kind of, uh, we've, we've been working pretty hard uh, over the last year. We've done a lot of in interesting events. We've uh, like, our first event was the launching of a skyscraper in Dubai, which was pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing how we got that deal, but it was, it was really cool, it was really fun. Uh, and then we went on to do some work with the with the Cannes Film Festival, and we also did some stuff with the Monaco Grand Prix, and and it was pretty amazing. That those were our first three gigs, and we're like, this is crazy. And then we've done a lot of interesting things uh, with a few other brands since then. Um, and I mean, the, the last year was kind of like you know influencer marketing focused. There was a lot of traveling around, mm -hmm. and uh, while I was doing that, uh, the whole idea was to to launch a platform to make it to make it scalable. You know, the agency side is really great, and I think we can do a lot of fun stuff with it, but uh, my whole idea is to, to make stuff, you know, and scale things that don't scale, kind of like yeah. paraphrasing Paul Graham or whatever, like, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, but I think it's kind of like, I think the, the, the creative industry right now, it's, it's, it's so powerful, it's so big, and it's getting more and more interesting now with you know, influencers, YouTubers, Instagrammers, you know, people sort of these young generation of, yeah, of yeah. friends who are influencing everybody else, mm -hmm. you know buying behaviors are changing and things like that <clears throat> so we we came up with we came up with some pretty interesting hypotheses at the in the beginning of the summer and then we tested them all out throughout the year and uh, uh, I, I actually leave to India in <clears throat> next week to 
to build uh, to build a platform. We're going to be building a platform that connects influencers, creatives, and brands mm -hmm. um, in a, <clears throat> an interesting way. So yeah, let's see how that goes. Nice. I, I really look forward to uh, to hearing more about that on or off the record, just to uh, yeah, absolutely yeah, to absolutely. see how it goes. Yeah. Um, how how do you find it working with uh, family and friends as well? But in this case, you're working with your sisters, so. Yeah, and I'm, I also work with my parents, so. It's oh kind yeah, of, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's like it is. It is definitely a unique situation to be in. Like, mm -hmm. I can't talk to my friends about it because no one else is doing it. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the only person, <laughs> like, there's a few people that I kind of are are famous online. Gary Vaynerchuk works with his brother, and mm -hmm. he worked with his dad, and there's a couple other guys. So it's kind of like there's a couple other people out there who are doing it. So, for me personally, it's 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 really really all about like over communication. Yeah. Like. It's like, you know, to one, like to a person, I mean, because your family takes, is bound to take stuff more personally. Mm -hmm. They just are. Like, and it's business at the end of the day, but it's still like your family first. Okay. Then there's business. So, so you got to be very clear about that. So sometimes, like, there's certain, of course, there's times <clears throat> where I would like to say stuff and do stuff that I know if I say it in a certain way, it's going to ruin everything. So I'll take a second and yeah. rewrite the email and, you know, make sure it's very clear and everything like that. So, mm -hmm. I think if I would if I were to say it like in one word, it's definitely worth it because <clears throat> I don't trust anybody else as much yeah. as I trust them, yeah. you know, my family. So uh, on the other hand, it's also it requires a lot of over communication. But I do think that starting your business with your family sets up a very interesting culture for your company later on. Yeah, <clears throat> because That's I true. think it's it's also like I mean because. We all hear, right? You want to have like a like a you want to you want to have like a tribe, a family, like you know. Mm -hmm. and I think I think if you if, actually start with the if family, you actually start yeah. with the family, it's kind of like it's okay. Hey, everybody else has to kind of join in, right? I mean, yeah. like and it's kind of like so that's what I'm sort of noticing right now. Like it's it's it is kind of slowly. That's how we're, when we're growing the team, we're getting people on board. It's kind of it's kind of becoming like that. Mm -hmm. And also the thing is, I think one of the most important things with the family is like is <clears throat> you don't want to put pressure on on family to, to either continue working with you or not continue working with you. Like that's kind of like, you know, like it's because with, with, with the person you have a contract and you have a deal. Okay, yeah. great. You work for a year, six months, three months, whatever. But the family, you don't always have that contract or deal. You sort of kind of like, you know, let it be. So what I do is I do the opposite. I'm like, hey, you want to leave? Just let me know. And I'm kind of like very, very open about it, very honest about it. Mm -hmm. And that only ends up, you know, usually relating in something a bit more cohesive. So yeah, it's, it, I'm I'm figuring it out every day. It's and yeah. there's good days and there's bad days, but I think it's it's definitely it definitely ends up being worth it at the end. Of it, so. so worth it and maybe more challenging than working uh, with people. I, I would I think I'd, I'd definitely say it's more challenging because like um, yeah, there's usually you know if if you're if you're like a, if you if you find a great startup co-founder or whatever or like a small startup team, you usually those guys have come together or girls or whatever the teams come together for building that product right yeah. for that but in the family usually it's usually because your family already and you found this idea interesting so mm -hmm. there is some more you know in, you know interhuman dynamics yeah at play but i think it's 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 worth it for sure yeah absolutely it's interesting because um yeah you, you hear passionate product and startup people talking about how they believe in the product, but as the company and the product changes over time, then you start losing the core members of the company and the the family is not the same anymore, right? But it, I guess if you work with your family originally, even though they anyone can leave at any point in time, it's still, I guess you still have the family bond no matter what. Mm, exactly. And I think, I mean, that's the most important thing. Like it, it is, it is family first. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's like, when people say that, but I think the... It comes to play when, when there's a tough decision and you know, like the person can't do it. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm when I'm, in, I'm, I'm a really fun guy, everything. But I'm, when I'm working, you know, I'm, I'm not yeah. always as fun because things need to be done, things need to get done. So there's times when, you know, like it hasn't worked out, like with my with my sisters or whatever, with my parents, and I, I've messed up or they've messed up, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like we have to check ourselves. And I think. Like, and I think you have to put your ego out of it. And I think yeah. with your friends or quote unquote friends or startup co-founders, you can really, let, you can keep that ego for much longer, mm -hmm. you know, because you can, you can fight and argue and no, 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 I was right. You were right. I was defend whatever, yeah, you know, like yeah. 
you can, but with your family, you, you can only do that or to a certain extent, and then you're like, wait, what the hell am I arguing with her yeah. for? You know, like, just forget about the ego, just get it out of the way, and let's focus on what we have to do. So, yeah, that's also yeah. really good. It's a healthy thing for me as well, personally. <laughs> it, it, it sounds um, much more balanced than, than, yeah, having the opposite. And I guess, I mean, you spend most of your life working, mm. um, so might as well do it with people. Oh, absolutely. That you're absolutely. I couldn't agree. Comfortable with. For sure. Yeah. Um, not, not to say that I mean, like I, I do also think like it is, it is, it is essential like to get more people on board than just your family, you mm -hmm. know. I, and I think that like, but like you said, the foundation starting off with them, I think, is is, is a good place to start. Is, is there a, an up switch, or is it kind of business and family time intertwine all the time when you when you start working on a project or something, or do you just stop at I, I mean, six p.m. I, no, <laughs> there's definitely no stopping at 6 p.m., no. I think like, but I also think that sort of goes back to my parents, the way they sort of, uh, we've seen them work and the way we've been around them. Like it, I do kind of get frustrated sometimes because it ends up being a bit too much about like just business in our family, with my parents as well. Uh, so slowly and, and last year and this year, we're kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, my parents as well, they're getting a bit older. So I'm kind of trying to find ways in which we can separate it. So, okay, maybe not nine to six but maybe like you know like a weekend a month or something like you know like whatever so because i think there you <clears throat> there needs to be that balance because otherwise it just ends up being about business all the time and then it, it's not always that fun yeah. mm -hmm. okay oh, that's that's uh, that's good to hear and i really like the fact that we can have this conversation where as you said not a lot of people uh, work are in business with their families so yeah. it's definitely a really unique perspective oh yeah and i think <clears throat> and, I, and i and that's why I, part of it is also like i i you know like i'm figuring it out every day because mm -hmm. it's like i can't really talk to people about it i'm like you know i, I can't talk to my family about it because i'm like i want to find out working with them so who yeah. do i talk to about it like there's not many people, <laughs> not none of my peers excuse me are working with their families so it's mm -hmm. like oh okay who do i talk to and i like you know but it's fun it's good Nice. <laughs> um, right, so we've talked about family and, and working in tech. Um, are there any specific things, companies or people who are inspirations to you or mentors maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think... <clears throat> it can be in the industry, but it can be yeah. anything else. Like, I think in the... I mean, recently I kind of... Um, one of Tim Ferriss's podcasts with uh, Derek Sivers... Mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of like, and I started emailing with Derek, and like, he actually replied the emails, and I was like, oh, okay, that's great. <laughs> and, 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 and we kind of have been emailing back and forth a little bit, and it's like, he's, he's like, I'm starting with the most recent one, and like, I just got an email from him before we, before we started the podcast. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just, it's just always nice to meet people who, who do what they say they're going to do. Preach. Yeah, it's yeah. you know, it's it's so rare. Like it's so rare when people, you're like, if you send me an email, I will reply it, and he actually replies it, not like a bullshit half-ass reply, but a really mm -hmm. thought out reply and everything. You're like, okay, so that that's inspiring, just in a simple, very small way. When if you say you're gonna do something, just do it, right? Yeah. I like that. But but besides that, the people like my my parents are definitely my inspiration. Like starting early, mm -hmm. like the way I've seen my dad and my mom work, I. have just it's just crazy and also like going from different industries like one industry was it was like fashion and garments to like now they're in natural health care like a totally Ooh, yeah yeah <laughs> totally different industry like and i don't know how the hell i mean my mom my mom was a doctor my dad became a doctor like when the transition was happening but like they changed industries completely like in their 40s so i'm like yeah. like i mean that's that's inspiring you know and i'm, I'm definitely inspired by them and I mean, besides my parents and like, and I, I, I definitely get inspired by by people who just, who who just kind of, you know, like, don't look at like the rules as as like as like, what do you call it? Like guarantees. Yeah. yeah. They're like they're like it's just an indication. Like we can go past it if we push it, if we're smart, if we're whatever. So. Yeah. I mean, like, there's so many guys I'm inspired by, but I mean, I used to play, I, my basketball is like my favorite sport, so, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, there's so many guys in, in, in sort of like Jordan, of course, and the typical people, but, like, the more I get into it, there's there's a couple of unsung heroes that go, like, you know, that, that are kind of, 
that have worked for years and years and years and kind of big like Stephen Curry now and uh, he's, he's popular now but like I've been a Warriors fan since like you know the 80s because uh, we know some people that play for the Warriors so it's kind of like those people who kind of just who are just grinders who just work 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 and mm-hmm. eventually they'll get known um yeah i mean i mean i i guess it's just like a few people like that that kind of inspire me and mentor like kind of who who have seen and worked with i think the guys in the next web boris and patrick like mm-hmm. we i mean i kind of just saw them do stuff and it was it was interesting to see a different style of, of like management because they're very very chill they're very fun guys and they're yeah and it was like wow that can also work you know because you see a way like it can work it can work in a really hardcore you know fearful top down way and then it can work in this sort of very chilled out mm-hmm. still you know getting stuff done way so it's kind of like i'm definitely inspired by that like that i mean who else inspires me anything like, um, I mean, like, I get inspired by a lot of people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, because I think, I think, like, I think I get inspired by some random people as well. Like, I, I, like, just, just, I just find people who just kind of push themselves. Yeah. Inspiring. Like, if you're someone who's gonna, who's gonna, like, you know, like, if you're, if you're overweight and you, you're like, you lose 10 kilos, that's awesome. Like, that, that's inspiring. You know, it's like, it's just like I just like people who do shit. Like I don't like people who just <laughs> sit and talk and waste their time. Like because I talk a lot, you know. So like I I I know personally that I need to do more shit and talk less. Like I know that. That's like a personal thing I have to work on in 2016, especially because it's a new year and everything. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm inspired by guys who and guys and girls and everybody who just who just shuts up and just does work and then you know like figures it out. So. Mm-hmm. And, like, one other guy, of course, who, like, talking about doing stuff, like Casey Neistat, the guy, the YouTuber, like, you know him, right? Yeah, Casey Neistat? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, especially with, like, like, especially with the new series of vlogging things that he's been doing, it's just like, come on, dude, that guy's crazy. Like, and it's it's just so, it's so inspiring to me to see someone like that and actually do stuff. Mm-hmm. And just, just, like, he's just like, okay, I'm just going to do stuff and, you know, sure, talk about it a little bit, but then do it. Yeah. I think that sort of honesty and doing it, that that's quite inspirational, I think. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I have to say you're possibly the most positive person that I know, at least in my contacts, in terms of sharing stuff and pointing out how motivating it is or how awesome it is or just putting some good positive vibes out there. I think you're, yeah, you're by far like <laughs> Thanks, the, the, the person. And, yeah. It. Thank you. It's always nice and refreshing compared, yeah. compared to seeing people complain or, you know, I mean, yeah, everyone yeah, has bad days, but like, I think so like I would, I would again credit that me being from India because, and I think like also the way my parents brought me up because I have a lot of, like, I just can't stand people who are negative. Like, if you're negative around me, then you can fuck off. Like, I don't have time to. Like, I just don't. Because <clears throat> because life is too short to be, you know, complaining or negative. Of course, like you said, we all have bad days and we're all down and we're all upset. Mm-hmm. Everybody has that. And I think, you know, just figure out a way that works for you. Jump, run, swim, have sex, do whatever you want to do. Like, you know, spend time with your loved ones, whatever. If to, you're not happy, find a way to change it. Find a way to change it and get happy. Because, like, like, I'm, like I... There was a, I think it was last year, 2000, not like 2014, at the end of 2014, mm-hmm. I was, I was like, I'll open up a little bit, I was, I was going through a really tough time and I was becoming very, very like negative, mm-hmm. like myself, and I just needed to hit that reset button and go back to India and just spend some time with my friends and my family and just like realize that like we, like there's a, there's a saying in Hindi where it's like, it's we come in naked and we leave naked. Like, that's it. You know, like there, there's nothing more. So just, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, mm-hmm. and when, in, when you're in India or in other countries in the world, like, you, know, you see people on the street who have nothing and they're still, like, living and they're kind of smiling, they're happy, they're doing their thing. And you see people with a lot of money who are fucking stressed out and you see people with a lot less money who are kind of happy and okay. And I think I, think I, 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 think I heard something Tony Robbins said once, like, when, like, life is about growing. Like, when you stop growing, you die. So mm-hmm. I think, like, yeah, that's, I kind of just have that sort of, I try and keep that positive attitude going. Like, hey, you know, okay, if, it's a, if you're tired, okay, you'll get, you'll get healthy. If you're fat, you'll get thin. If the plane is stuck, what are you going to do about it? You know, you can't do much. So, <laughs> 
might as well just make the best of it. And if there's no Wi-Fi, awesome, read. If there's Wi-Fi, work, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah, so I just try, I try and be positive. Of course, I, you know, we all have to work on it, but thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks no, that's, that's really cool. Um, I really love that. Um, is there someone dead or alive that you'd like to have uh, a conversation with? It can be a, a two-hour long dinner, it can be 45 minutes over coffee, or it can be some drinks at an after party at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. in the morning. I, I, I like all those things. So can I pick one for each? Like one for coffee? Oh, you one can do one, at, uh, one overall or one for each? I think I'll do one for each because then it will be more fun. I think. Please so, like, do. What, yeah, one for coffee, one for the dinner? Uh, long dinner, coffee, or and uh, or after party drinks. Okay, cool. I think I think like and like, why obviously okay sure yeah I think for the for the like a coffee um, I definitely like to have coffee with uh, with Mahatma Gandhi like it would just be fun to talk to the guy like mm -hmm. but like you know I think coffee would be enough because uh, <laughs> like what I what I read with him what I read about him and what I've read yeah. like about, like he was very straight to the point and like you know kind of really well read so it'd be fun to talk to him and get in, and sort of just understand how because because what he did for Indian independence was was just it was hard yeah you know it was really really difficult so guys who can sort of get through stuff that's difficult mm -hmm. and how the fuck do you get through that like what sort of mindset you need to have to sort of do something which is difficult already like you know get independence for india and then do it in the most difficult way like ahimsa you know being what do you call it non-violent mm -hmm. how the hell do you figure that out and i mean also there's and also personally there's like in india there's, there's a second school of thought that like Gandhi was, you know, like uh, there's a conspiracy theory that he was sort of, uh, you know, kind of paid by the British and all that shit. I would just ask him, yo, bro, were you paid by the British? What's up? Like, did you take the money? <laughs> I was like, I want, I, want, like, I want us to get to know what's up. And I think a coffee would be enough for that. You know, that would be fun. I've never heard about this. Uh, no, there was, there was like a big conspiracy yeah. theory in India like that, uh, that he was sort of like, you know, in cahoots with the Brits and... And a whole bunch of stuff. And, of course, you don't hear about it here because Gandhi is considered, like, God. Yeah. But everyone is a human. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But, I mean, I would just like, I mean, he's, he's still one of the most important people in history. No doubt about that. Yeah. Especially for the Indian people. But I, I think... the pragmatism, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, it would be fun to, like, just be like, yo, bro. Okay, so I get all this <laughs> stuff. So, what's up, you know? Be honest with me, dude. Like, yeah. what happened? And you know, it's only us here. And for, for dinner... I'd love to know what Gandhi yeah. thinks about what the world is going through at the moment, whether it's oh, yeah. the U.S. and politics or the situation in Europe, oh, yeah. the, the migrant crisis, everything. It, it would be fascinating. I think, I think it would be fun to sort of see what he would, yeah, his view of his viewpoint on stuff is as well. Yeah, for sure, definitely. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah, and so for dinner, definitely, like the dinner, I think, I mean, because you have to have someone a bit more, you know, like I would say like chatty. Mm -hmm. I, like I definitely would like to sort of have... Um, I don't know, like, I think someone like Sun Tzu, Art of War, the guy who wrote The Art mm -hmm. of War, like, someone like him would be fun over dinner, like, you know, just to, you know, understand some, or, or like Marcus Aurelius to someone, like, someone, a philosopher, like, you know, who, who would open up more with some bottles of wine, and, you know, like, yeah. get some real stuff coming out, so, someone like that, I think, and I think understanding, understanding, um, like, again, like I told you, going back to when I was 12, like, understanding how humans work, like, Mm -hmm. how people think and like getting a bit of understanding of that's sort of that would be fun yeah yeah i think that would be nice yeah and i think the after party would be definitely definitely with like andy warhol or someone like that like someone who's sort of who's <laughs> you know because i do have one foot in sort of art and fashion and i'm really yeah. into that sort of so andy warhol or you know one of those guys from like that era who who only would open up once they've had too much to drink and too much of cocaine so like okay yeah. great I don't do drugs, but like I'll definitely come have a couple more drinks with you at the after party or get a burger or whatever. So I think Andy Warhol would be definitely fun, or like Basquiat or someone, you know, someone like that who who could sort of who just has influenced like a different part of humanity, art and culture in such yeah. a strong way. And you know, so yeah, those are my few people. Yeah. It's funny because I I had no idea what you would answer for any of these, but <laughs> I. I in, in my preparing the podcast, um, not just the conversation with you, but also other episodes, I never mm -hmm. even considered uh, people like Andy Warhol or Basquiat. Yeah. Um, and that actually reminds me of uh, an amazing evening that I've, I've spent in Paris where it was basically like that kind of an after-party thing spent with artists. And I 
honestly, looking back, I have no idea what I was doing there or what led to me <laughs> being there because it's not, I didn't know anyone else prior to that thing. But yeah, artists, uh, especially no, in this context, they're fascinating. Oh, no, my God. And especially because like, like the, I think, I think, I don't know exactly, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this, but like the part of the brain that, you know, feels and like emotes uh, mm -hmm. is not connected like as strongly to the part of the brain that creates speech. Mm -hmm. So, so like, hence alcohol and drugs and all that stuff, you know, like, I think that kind of stuff would open artists up and especially guys like Warhol or Basquiat or, you know, like Chanel or any of these crazy, you know, people who influenced sort of art and culture and fashion in such a strong, and people because of that, because of, you know, how they influenced that. I think it would definitely be an interesting, you know, conversation to have, and yeah, I'll just make sure I keep my recorder with me and record everything, and then you know when I'm when I'm sobered up. Yeah, yeah, then you can listen back to it. I can listen to Gandhi, and then you know well, Sun Tzu and and uh, <laughs> Seneca, and then and the artists after that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah that will be fun. Um, okay, so we're gonna circle back to your um, career um, and going personal. Yeah. And I'd like you to tell me something that you're ashamed of or tell me about a failure that, that you've yeah. had. Um, I think we kind of touched on this, but if, if you wouldn't mind opening up and... and sure, sure. Yeah, more, more, more than happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I really, first of all, like, you know, really appreciate you doing this, like you in general, starting the whole podcasting thing because it's like it's it is hard to do anything, especially you put yourself out there and, you know, mm -hmm. make work. So... Like really, really respect that of you, and that's why I was more than happy to get on. You know, being the you know happy to be like your first uh, guest or whatever. Yes, super happy about that. No, but um, so yeah, props to that and respect for doing that. But the the easiest part is the conversation that we're having. The hard part is going to be hours <laughs> spent editing it. Exactly. <laughs> that's why I'm like, you know, good luck for that as well. Like, yeah. uh, but um, the so. Before I started um, my company, I uh, was doing a lot of events. I was organizing a bunch of, a bunch of events. So, this uh, current company or no, 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 the, my first company when I was like uh, eighteen, nineteen. Mm -hmm. So like, um, so I'd organized, uh, or, or I think it was during the company. I was crazy doing some crazy stuff while I was running a business too. Uh, I I was part of a team that organized a TEDx conference, and that did really well. So I was all you know like macho and overconfident and oh my god if I can organize a TEDx, TEDx conference and I felt <laughs> I did I felt that I did a lot of the work mm -hmm. and I did but there were some very key players in it that I didn't you know mm -hmm. take into mind so I I uh, came up with the concept for a party um, which was at one of the biggest clubs <clears throat> I think the biggest club uh, in Rotterdam I think one of the biggest in Europe and we had to sell 10,000 uh, tickets um, yeah. and um I invested my own money into it, and we got some very, very big name DJs and some very, very big name people to come down, um, and it went to shit. And, <clears throat> and like people didn't buy tickets, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the venue wasn't full. <clears throat> and uh, for like a 18-year-old kid, 19-year-old kid to lose 25,000 euros in a weekend Ouch. was was really hard. Like it was very difficult, and and I'd borrowed money from my mom and my dad. Which is even 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 worse because my parents were not like my parents are like a rich family or they're not super you know well off they're hardworking people. So I mean, it was, e even if they were though, it's still it's yeah, it's still a lot of money yeah. and it still hurts, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like it was a very 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 tough tough weekend, and I remember like feeling like I grew ten years in that weekend. Yeah, like the amount of money I lost, and and I mean they say, you know, everyone says yeah, like learn hard learn fast or whatever mm, but it's still yeah. fuck yeah failure yeah, but it still fucking hurts like it, yeah. it hurts like hell and and that sort of really you know taught me a lot about trusting people and money management and a whole bunch of other things but that was that's one that comes to mind there have been many others like you know but like in the sense of monetary value and and like just feeling like a stupid fool and a whole bunch of other emotions uh, you know that and eventually, at the end of it, coming out of it and learning from it, but that was definitely like one of the one of the big ones that definitely hurt. Mm -hmm. Also, the way I sold my the way I sold my company, uh, I felt like it was a failure because I sold it for one fifth of its value, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, again, again, like I said, it came down to the trusting people, right? I trusted the wrong person, so that sort of opened up, like that sort of you know screwed everything up. So, and I think that's I think we're trusting people. 
you know, it's something that's a, a lifelong lesson, a lifelong journey. I think like that's what you know motivates me and inspires me like so much is that the more I can spend time understanding how people work, how they're motivated, what you know, what inspires them, what how do like how can I trust somebody and those kind of things also like in business but also in life in general I think that's that's super important skill so I would say those two come to mind as being like the top two act like business like career failures yeah uh, you know there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that I've done but <laughs> that we can go into now or another time but um, but yeah that definitely yeah so yeah well circling back on the on the trust uh, thing I think. It's interesting that you've taken it the, the other way around and, and started working with your family after that, and that makes yeah, sense in a way. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Because because like that, I realized like, and I think I also heard like uh, Brian Chesky, the guy who's the CEO of uh, Airbnb, Airbnb, like he was talking about like how you know the the single most important thing for them since 2008, since they sort of started mm -hmm. having more than a few co-founders is about people, management, trust, organizing your team and everything. So I think that is, and I mean, a company like Airbnb, which is like one of the most recent uh, super success stories, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's key to not forget that in our, in our tech world where everything is online and everything is perfect, Slack, Trello, all that stuff, you know, at the end of it, behind the Slack and the Trello, there's people. And it's all about trusting people and managing people and motivating them and, and you know, the one plus one, in a team should equal 11, not two. You know, I think it's about finding yeah. the synergies and like really making a team that is much, much, much greater than the sum of its mm -hmm. parts. You know, like doing doing really fun stuff. So not about just you know finding okay people. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like uh, I like how this uh, this conversation has gone so far. Um, <clears throat> so we've talked about failures. Uh, now you can uh, we can be uh, move back to a more positive. Uh, thing and, and Sounds good. Uh, tell me about something that you're proud of. Uh, something that I'm proud of. Um, Possibly something that you learned. Um, yeah, I think I think like I think I'm really like if I if I if I I'm really proud of of the people around me at mm -hmm. the moment. It's like because I've I mean like the the like the friends I've chosen to be friends with, you know, because I've gone through like, you know me, I'm quite a social guy. I have a lot of, you know, contacts here and there, but it's like, I've sort of chosen to, you know, okay, these are my contacts, my business, and these are my friends, people yeah. I spend time with, people I really love being around, you know, and I think I'm proud of them and I'm really, really proud of myself that I've made that decision. I mean, you know, I'm proud of my, my parents, but I think it like personally as well, like I'm really excited and, and I think, uh, looking forward to all, everything that I've learned in the last year with mm -hmm. building this new app, with building my new platform, mm -hmm. and really launching it. Because I do believe that the industry, our industry, you know, the tech creative industry needs a bit of an overhaul, needs a bit of a push mm -hmm. in a modern, in sort of more tech direction, mm -hmm. while, of course, having people and trust at the core yeah, of it, yeah, of we spoke about. So I think, I think I'm very, very excited. And I think I'm also like, I'm, and I'm, you know, Pride is an emotion that I don't feel that often because, like, it's 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 very close to egotistic, <laughs> for in my opinion. But it, but yeah, I'm definitely like in a, in a good well, like good sense of pride. I'm definitely proud about what I'm gonna do. Like it hasn't happened yet, but I'm but all the all the all the wireframes and all the hard work and everything that I've been working on, yeah. and also all the all the you know feedback I'm getting from people in the industry, including yourself when we spoke earlier. You know, and I think it's like it's it's. It's yeah, I'm, I'm proud about what's gonna happen in the coming in the coming few months, and also yeah, just 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 proud of you know where I am right now. I think it's it's like it could have gone much worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'm very happy with that. Yeah, can't complain. No. <laughs> awesome. Um, I think we're close to wrapping up, uh -huh. so I just want to finish off with um, you telling me about what's gonna happen for you in the future, uh, personally or business-wise. Yeah. And then, if you have anything to promote, now is yeah. the time to do it. Yeah, um, like I said, I think I've, I've talked about this a little bit already. So personally, like I'm, I'm, if, I if I think about personally, like in the future, I definitely just non-business related. I, I definitely want to build deeper relationships with people. Not mm -hmm. you know, so that's a very important. Like that's what I learned the last year. I think also because 
like it's great to make like there's a funny joke i don't need more friends unless you have a helicopter you know it's like i don't need <laughs> like, i don't i mean but but it's like not to go that far but i definitely want to make i want to meet great people and make new contacts and stuff like that but i definitely yeah. still want to just go deeper with my friends that i currently have and with the relationships that i currently have and my, mm-hmm. also with my family and stuff like that and I just also kind of just want to get fitter this year. Like, you know, I want to feel back to being physically like I was when I, because I climbed a mountain when I was younger. When I was 16, I, I climbed a, a mountain in the Himalayas, Nanda Devi. And I was, I remember, like, I, I spoke about it recently with some friends about doing another trek up another mountain. And I was like, I just want to fucking get fit again. Like, I just miss, <laughs> just miss being able to, like, just, you know, be that, have that high level of energy the entire day. And especially mm-hmm. now, with the things that we're all doing, you know, with, with, with and especially what I'm going to launch next year, um, which being kind of one of the main focuses, I need to be physically and mentally and emotionally at a state of high performance, you know. So yeah. part of that is, of course, physical fitness, but again, get back into meditation, get back into yoga, get back into my spiritual side a little bit, because I am, I am quite spiritual, you know, like, I mean, in, in a sense, like, the word spirituality and religion gets thrown around in a very, very kind of oh my god don't talk about religion yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like yeah it's a way of life you know it's a lifestyle and, and sort of i'm spiritual in that sense to so get back into that as well and yeah the main, yeah and i think the main thing is yeah just uh check me out on twitter like geet posla on twitter and i think mm-hmm. i'm going to be definitely putting a lot of information on there about my new my, my new um product about the new app the company the agency is called gdnk so gdnk and gdnk.co okay so yeah. It, yeah i'll uh, i'll be putting links yeah. to all of that Perfect. Yeah. but it's like but that's the agency that's going to be making the site but making the product the product's going to be called something totally different i don't know what it's going to be called yet I, i'd like to build it first <laughs> yeah and then with the name you know do it do it uh, i don't know old-fashioned way whatever <laughs> but <laughs> Uh, but you know, get it. But I'm working on that. And just yeah, my Twitter is probably the best way to you know keep keep uh, keep track of everything. Yeah, but yeah, that's it. Okay, well, that's uh, that's really awesome. And again, thanks for being my uh, my first guest. I've, I can't believe we've lasted this long. Which is yeah, me neither. I'm surprised. <laughs> great, great for future episodes. Absolutely. Hey, cool. Um, and that's it for the first episode of the Digital Digest podcast. I really love the human approach that Geet has. He hustles and makes things happen, but at the core of everything he does, there is empathy towards other individuals, trust in people, and an optimism that is rare in people nowadays. Talking with Geet, I am reminded that each and every one of us go through good and bad times, some people more than others. But no matter what, if you keep moving forward and trust that you will bounce back, you can absolutely overcome what life throws at you. Before I finish the episode, I'd like to apologize for the sound quality. This interview was recorded a few days before I received my new microphone, which I'm using right now. This also explains why the intro and outro are of a much better quality. It also means that everything should hopefully sound better in the future. As always, you can find Digital Digest online at digest.digital and on Twitter at DigiDigest. If you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter and know when we get new episodes out or uh, get some extra content, you can subscribe at newsletter.digest.digital. Finally, I'm using Instagram as a way to share snippets and additional content. And if you're interested in that, you can follow the podcast at digest.digital, same as the URL. I'm your host, Tibbs, at itibs on Twitter, I-T-I-B-Z, and I look forward to sharing another interview with a different guest very soon. Thanks again for listening, and don't forget to share this with your friends. Bye-bye. The reason I pushed it back an hour, because I had to run eight kilometers to train for my marathon, took oh. a bit longer. I expected so yeah that's okay which uh which marathon Amsterdam yeah uh, the Rotterdam one yeah in April okay. so I was kind of feeling a little bit unhealthy uh December like Christmas time so I just did the crazy thing and signed myself yeah. up for the marathon so now I have I have to run no matter what oh yeah yeah I think I saw you post something on Facebook about yeah that. and I took it off because there's this whole psycho <clears throat> there's this whole psychology of like you know when you put something on Facebook or you get your friends to cheer you on you kind of already feel like you've done it and I didn't want that I wanted to actually like right yeah 
Uh, so I put it up and then I took it off. But yeah. 